we were doing sexual education in school and I went to a convent school and we all had to write down, you know, anonymous, anonymously a question that we had on a piece of paper. And then, you know, a sister evangelist who was the one at the time would read how many <laughs> questions, you know, so, <laughs> so she did her best. She really did her best. But, but the questions were really interesting. You know, it was like, how can you get pregnant if you have sex with your tights on? You know, because we were thinking of we were wearing our, our school uniforms. Genuine question, you know, or like, what is a blowjob? Uh, Stuff like that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and as you say, you don't necessarily want to go on Google for all of these things because you just don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Science Week podcast with Science Foundation Ireland. I'm Anne-Marie Tomczak and first let me give you a quick overview of Science Week. It's a national celebration of science in our day-to-day lives and there are hundreds of events for people of all ages unfolding all across Ireland. Science Week 2022 will be taking place between the 13th and the 20th of November with the theme for this year being infinite possibilities. On this episode, we're going to be talking about debunking the myths. Now, debunking the myths is a project that aims to provide young people with clear, reliable and scientifically proven information about sexual health in an engaging way. On today's episode, we're joined by two experts who are helping to deliver this program. The clinical lecturer at the Rotunda Hospital, Dr. Ronan Daly, and Dr. Zara Malfi, the research director at the RCSI the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. It's lovely to have you both on, uh, Zara and Ronan. Zara, can I start with you? As the project co-lead, can you give us an idea of what exactly debunking the myths is? Sure, Anne-Marie. So in today's climate of fake news, it can be very difficult for teenagers to find reliable sources of information about their sexual and their reproductive health. Um, We have found that teenagers are learning more about their bodies and health issues from film, television, social media, um, and the internet um, so often they are um, exposed to standardized images that can help perpetuate myths and unrealistic body standards so basically our program consists of a STEM expert-led series of two-hour interactive workshops and online engagement tools that provide teenagers with clear and reliable information and um, what we do at the workshops is we discuss sexual health and we demonstrate debunk associated myths um, in a safe and unbiased environment. Ronan, can we just talk to you? Your work is in obstetrics and uh, gynecology and just want to bring you in here as well as quick as we can. Um, are there any particular health, health concerns uh, that come up more than others that these workshops are, are aiming to address? Yeah, so we try and discuss, you know, a range of topics during the, the um, session. So we discuss things like STIs and contraception. Uh, we talk about and uh, anatomy, we talk about uh, consent and then sexual assault treatment. Um, but one of the things that you know we've seen consistently from the data in Ireland is that a year, especially since last year, there's been uh, high cases of um, uh, STIs in, in people who are between 15 and 24, so young people in Ireland. It's risen since last year, um, which was consistent with previous years as well. Um, half of all chlamydia cases in Ireland are between uh, the ages of 15 and 24. Um, things like herpes are more common in that age group. About 20% of gonorrhea cases are in that age group. Um, so, you know, those things have a, a high degree of impact potentially on people's health and well-being generally. Um, there's a lot of stigma associated with them. There's a lot of shame and judgment around STI. So it's you know a a good opportunity to try and engage with students in that and talk about them and what are their misconceptions about SDIs Um, and things like even just you know the language to be used avoiding saying things like clean or things like that when you're talking about STI checks and what happens at an STI check as well so it's a really good opportunity to engage with a group that is at high risk of these things um, at a very kind of important time in their lives. So if the numbers are going up, you know, of, of STIs in that uh, age group between 15 and 24, is there anything that's telling us why that's happening? I suppose a lot of it is probably, you know, the thing we see consistently at the at these sessions is we use a, an app called Mentimeter where students can submit um, answers to questions. They can, we generate word clouds about their opinions and feelings about things. And consistently we see around STIs, people talk about the shame and judgment and embarrassment and feelings that they have um, you know talking about even talking about it with other people or you know going to have an STI test done or anything like that and um, so we really try and work to 
demystify all that aspect of it, talk to them about what happens when you go to uh, get an STI test from the very basic stuff of who's who are you going to meet when you walk through the door, who, you know, the, the doctor or nurse that you might meet, what tests will they do, um, what happens afterwards, how long do you wait for results. So I think giving people the information that you can, and we've seen that again in, you know, a number of scenarios in terms of the more information people have, the, the better they're able to, to look after their own health and, and take responsibility for it themselves. So like information is kind of empowerment in, in this instance, but we're talking about scientifically proven information. And I suppose we're living in this information age where there's just so much noise and so many uh, sources of information. One of the big challenges now is like, where do you actually even begin to get your information? And, and you mentioned there at the beginning that it's very natural for people to want to go to their peers, for example, to talk about uh, sex sex or sexual health as they may feel more safe in those kind of forums but often you know or there are there's potential that the information being shared by you know peer-to-peer isn't always reliable um zara i see you nodding your head there you know (laughs) what are the risks of like just relying on your friends for this for this so uh, in this case, there's a huge amount of risks associated with teenagers relying on their friends and also relying on Dr. Google um, because there is an awful lot of misinformation out there. Um, so typically, if teenagers kind of Google their symptoms or if anyone, in fact, yeah, Google their we've symptoms. We've all done it. You know, you have a sore yeah. throat and then you, you suddenly think you're actually, you've got like a couple of days left to live. For sure. So you're you're flooded with information yeah. from websites, from forums, social media, videos, the thing is like how do you know what's reliable what's relevant and what isn't so there are risks in using online health resources um, and they do include anxiety fear and kids already you know have enough stress and pressure on them with you know exam time and all these different uh, factors that impact their lives so mis misdiagnosis and self misdiagnosis is obviously a huge danger um so what we want to do is to empower teenagers to know where to go and um, like start with your go-to websites and um, like HSE resources, sexualwellbeing.ie, our own website, debunkingthemyths.ie. Um, so obviously to consider the source, um, you know, is it reputable? Is it from a well-known organization? Has it been peer reviewed by experts? Um, and obviously then to evaluate the evidence. So is it based on scientific information? Um, is it unbiased? Is it slanted? So we kind of try to help teenagers understand all of these factors. And is there a role for teenagers to help each other navigate this? Because I was, you know, thinking about how we, how the nature in which information is received now has really changed, you know, we're reliant so heavily on our phones or our um, mobile devices or, you know, uh, tablets, etc. Um, and if you think back to how, for example, I uh, went through sex education, it was via a book, you know, it was pre days of having a smartphone, I didn't have a phone uh, at all and uh, read uh, a book um, but there's a very natural instinct to want to talk to people that you that you know and I'm thinking of the, that scene in Netflix uh, in Bridgerton the Netflix series Bridgerton where um, uh, Daphne she's got married to the Duke of Hastings and you know she wants to start a family and you there's a scene where uh, she goes to one of uh, the staff uh, who lives in her home to ask them about how uh how babies are made effectively you know the birds and the bees because that talk didn't happen <laughs> now that's an extreme example but it it, it kind of shows two things one that you go to where uh, the source is of someone you feel safe and you can trust but but secondly the nature in which information and how it uh, is being shared has totally changed obviously since the times in which a show like that is set in yeah, absolutely. So we have found um, the ESRI published a report in 2021 and they assessed that teenagers at age 13 and 17, um, well, they, sorry, they surveyed a number of teenagers um, from 13 to 17. Um, while they were 13 years of age, um, they really got their information from their friends, their family, while by 17, their most common source of information was their peers. Um, so they also kind of did some other questioning around that and they basically found that teenagers that got most of their information from friends were significantly less likely to report using contraception when they first had sex. 
So that can also impact then, you know, STIs and the spread of them, the prevalence of them in society. So things like Ronan was just talking about there um, in the recent stats in Ireland. Like uh, we talked a bit about the risk, but just there was just something you said there, Ronan, around the stigma and some of the shame associated around STIs. But there's also for women, you know, uh, your reproductive future um, as someone working in obstetrics and gynecology, you know, there's there's big risks associated with things like gonorrhea, for example, um, and that can affect your your fertility, which may not seem like a, a very important thing when you're uh, 15 years old. You're not thinking of you're not necessarily thinking of starting a family at that age. But these are things that could come uh, into focus further down the line as well. Yeah, definitely. It's something, as you say, it's not something probably most, you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds are thinking about, but uh, they can have very long lasting impact on fertility, but um, especially chlamydia gonorrhea associated with things like pelvic inflammatory disease that can cause huge issues um, later on. Things like herpes, again, can have a big impact on um, delivery options for, for, for people who are, who are having children in terms of whether they have a vaginal delivery or a cesarean section. So, you know, these things are going to have have the potential to have a very long term impact on their um you know their own per, their their own health, their obstetric health, um, their reproductive health going forward. So it's you know even and some people especially when we talk about the, the these things at those sessions they've never even considered that it's not something that you know people would would know or, or or do so i think it's important to try and give them information in a way that they can understand it as well at their level that yes they understand that you know that's probably not going to be a current issue for them but these are things that in addition to all the worry and the stress about it and the the judgment they might perceive or the stigma they might feel that they also you know it's important for them to take to try and and take steps to work on their uh, to work on their own health um you know for, for for going forward in the future and the potential outcomes it could have so how do the workshops work? You know, how how do you begin putting together a program like this? Are there particular things that you're trying to achieve? Yeah, so we kind of started by reviewing um, topics covered in the RSE curriculum and how we as a team of obstetricians and gynecologists could build on it. Um, so we can also obviously then provide access to healthcare professionals um, who are experts in the field. Um, because teenagers may not necessarily feel comfortable discussing, you know, their sexual health or their concerns with their parents, with their teachers or, you know, in a school environment. And um, so we want to take them out of their school environment and to engage with them and, you know, use apps, use this really useful app called Mentimeter, like Rona mentioned. So, you know, they can submit questions anonymously. And again, removing the stigma again, that they're not going to be named. They're not going to be you know, identified as the one that asked this question. Um, so yeah, that's that's really um, how the workshops kind of came about and the benefits of them. We'll talk a little bit more about that in part two. But Ronan, um, before we break, um, can we just talk about the sexual assault treatment unit um, in the Rotunda? It does some really valuable work. Tell us about the type of treatments that are common uh, that you're encountering there. Yeah, so there's actually six ex sexual assault treatment units around the country. Um, there, there's one in the Rotunda here. They're in Cork, Waterford, place like that as well. But um, so there's kind of three main functions, I suppose, um, of the the sexual assault treatment unit, uh, which is one is things like forensic examination. So that's if you know someone reports a sexual assault to the guardi and it's involved in legal proceedings, that you know samples and things will be taken, um, and you know there's medical a record of of everything that has happened uh, to be used later in those kind of proceedings but um two of the other things i think which which are really you know amazing functions of it are one is that they also provide a service for a health check so for people who don't feel comfortable or don't wish to proceed with um you know legal action or involve the guardi they cover a lot of ground in terms of providing emergency contraception for people who've been the victim of sexual assault they provide post exposure prophylaxis for you know prevention of hiv transmission uh, sti screenings you know follow up referral to counseling so they provide a lot of other um other kind of services as well and then one of the other things which I think is, is very you know useful and um, is very patient-centered is that they also provide for the storage of samples so if a person 
does he does um attend to the the satu and decides at that time they don't feel comfortable going to the guardi or going to you know initiating legal proceedings or anything like that they can have their samples taken and stored there and if they decide at a later date that that is something they feel ready to do or feel comfortable to do they can proceed and and the satu has those sample, samples stored for them um so you know we try and give students a kind of an overview of the the sexual assault treatment unit and what it does as it's very important about 25 percent of people who attend the satu are under the age of 18 and 40 percent of them are uh, people who are either attending school or att- attending colleges and um, so it's a very much a, a significant you know factor for young people and trying to give them that information of you know this is what what they're here to do and here to help as much as they can um, and try and talk a little them, bit about that making them aware that you exist knowing you know where to get help when you're in a very distressing situation yeah and i think that that's something um that we see time again we see it with with the sexual assault treatment unit you know what why, where do you go who do you call how do you, how do you get seen there at all you know the contact information for, for that had the setup of it the same thing similarly with you know getting an sti test done or anything like that you know what's the first step because it's trying to give them evidence-based you know practical advice about this and and kind of how they're going to to, that they can use in their lives to try and help with these these health concerns that we have okay we'll pause there for a breather and we'll see you in part two welcome back so today we're talking about debunking the myths and uh, I wanted to get a flavor from Ronan and Zara about the biggest myths that come up like what are the ones that uh, people keep um, perpetuating about sexual health. Um, I can start off. Um, so one common one that we have encountered is the morning after pill only works the morning after sex. With well, the um, name, so kind of, to be fair, the name. Yeah, be. yeah, exactly. So at the moment now, that is false. So there's a number of different options. There's a three-day pill, there's a five-day pill, and now there's also... Um, the use of the copper coil um, in this case too. So there's other options apart from, you know, a one day turnaround. However, um, you know, it is most effective the sooner you can get it. Um, and obviously then to assess whether the sex was protected, unprotected, um, you know, then to consider other steps that you may need to take. Any other myths that come up, Ronan? Um, yeah, I sp- one of the things we get and we commonly get questions about it as well is, you know, can I get pregnant if tends to be a common recurring yeah. theme. Uh, one of the things, you know, we would uh, sometimes get is asking, you know, can you get pregnant if you have sex when you're on your period? And we do, in, you know, tell people that the chances of that, while they're, they are lower, uh, they're not zero. Uh, and especially if it's unprotected sex, but especially with things like some people will have, you know, light bleeding during the middle of their cycle around the time of ovulation. Um, you know, semen can stay alive in the vaginal tract for 72 hours after sex. So they so might think there are periods if they have a bit of spotting, uh, but they're not actually menstruating just yet. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that kind of you can talk a bit about it and, and explain to people that, you know, there's no quote unquote safe time of the month to to have sex without contraception where there is no where there is no risk of pregnancy. Um so it's it's important and, and you know that's something typical we see. We get a lot of those kinds kinds of questions, but they're important to ask and they're especially ones that we get into the anonymous kind of section of of the of the portion where people can ask anonymous questions because people probably don't feel comfortable asking their mom or maybe they've had the same gp since they were six years old and they don't particularly want to ask him or her so i think it's just important that they get the chance to ask those kinds of questions are we getting better though at talking about things like sex you know ireland as a society we have a history of being a very catholic nation and very conservative and we've had uh, seen a lot of uh, social change and cultural change in Ireland um, are we becoming a bit more open about that kind of thing I, I think that we are I think they did a they did a really good study where they looked at the um, rates of teenage pregnancies in Ireland over the last 20 years I think it was from 2000 to, to, to 2020 and in 2000 there was uh, 8,000 or so teenage births in that year and oh, sorry 3,000 sorry 3,000 births in that year and um, then in 2020 there was 830 so they've reduced it by like 75 percent almost um, and part of one of the things they found that seemed to be a big contributing factor to that was 
you know, education in schools improving, you know, being able to to have reliable sources of information to go to 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 understand more, and um, people being uh, more, uh, you know, having a more access to to contraception as well as another factor. So lots of things like that were um were, were included in it. But it was just very, you know, I think we are getting better. I think we have a lot of ways to go, but I think we are getting better at at, at talking about those issues. And I suppose um being able to assert yourself, you know, as a young person, there's a lot of pressure coming from lots of different quarters when you're young. I know myself, even when I was uh, in uh, secondary school, there's a pressure to be like an adult. Even if you feel like you're still a child or a teenager, there's often like this all sorts of external pressures, uh, whether it's with, from your peer group or actually just from all the messaging you're receiving um uh you know out there in the in the world uh, whether it's on tv or uh, on social media and uh, there's this pressure so if you have that information you perhaps you're more empowered to be able to be more decisive for yourself and take ownership of your own you know sexual health yeah I, I think that's a huge part of it. And I think giving people the the access to, to, you know, websites that they can look up, you know, when they're, they're thinking about these things and they're feeling these pressures and not just relying on what, you know, people in school are saying at lunch or, you know, those kind of things, or it, it really does seem to, to, um, be a, a great opportunity for people to take that responsibility and to get that take that chance to to kind of work on their own understanding and their own feelings about you know sex and and sexual health how does the program keep up uh, to pace with the i guess the social norms around uh, sexual identity and uh, sexual health and you know how does it cater to people for example who uh, may have different gender uh, identifications uh, or sexual orientations uh, uh, these things the way in which these things are spoken about um are changing and evolving um and so you know is there an, a particular approach for how you might uh, talk about gender identity for example or consent these you know topics that um have a lot of nuance, but also there's science as well that can actually help in this situation. Yeah, so we're very fortunate to be working with a broad range of experts to deliver, you know, a positive and extensive program to teenagers. So um, we do bring in experts in health psychology to, to discuss um, the likes of consent. And um, so we have um, an amazing lecturer in RCSI. Her name is Dr. Caroline Kelleher. She's a lecturer in health psychology. Um, so she runs a fantastic, really interactive piece on consent. Um, so we don't do that ourselves. We do bring in um, Caroline. So it's expert led all of the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we obviously try to be as inclusive and unbiased um, and provide all information in a non-judgmental way. And is it just for the for the teenagers or this, you know, um, specific age group? Because it feels like... Um, parents or teachers or lots of other people could benefit from perhaps attending some of these sessions as well <laughs> well we do have um quite a big number of teachers that do attend the workshops um with this with the teenagers and we do send kind of consent packs home to parents so they're aware of the program we do point them in the direction of the website and available resources just in case they want to you know check them out as well and learn something new um, so, Ronan, can we talk about the practical things uh, that have been put in place as a result of uh, the workshops from debunking the myths? Yeah, so I suppose uh, we try and kind of get students involved. It's very, you know, an interactive sessions. There's usually at the start, there's a lot of laughing. The first time someone says penis or vagina, there's usually a good chorus of laughter, but those tend to, to die away as the session goes on. Um, but, you know, we try and give students um tangible things that they can um that they can you know a, a look at and touch and understand so we have things like uh, a small little um, mannequin to demonstrate how a marina coil is inserted and um, we have a, a model of an upper arm um to demonstrate what the contraceptive implant feels like under the skin for people um so we you know would also do we do demonstrations of how to put a condom on in front of students again there's usually a lot of laughter <laughs> at that point um but you know it's it's very very important for them to actually see these things and understand them better um, and we try and give them you know practical resources that they can use so um, one of the websites that we would always mention is the sh24.ie so they're a website that provides free at-home STI testing kits to um, 
to anyone and they will get a package sent out to their home. Do you know, we tell the students it's not going to come with a big, massive STI test written on the box. Mm. It's going to come in like, this, you know, a little small white package um, that they can do their testing at home. We actually show them the different swabs that are in the, the testing kit. We show them the urine samples, bottles that they would use. And um, so we show them those things. And then, you know, we tell them about how they'll get their results within a certain amount of time. And then, you know, how the follow up would work if they did test positive. How does contact tracing work? So it's about trying to give them kind of something that they can see and understand and then you know a a very practical tangible thing quite a a proactive and really sex positive approach as well also as well as being fact-based you know and I'm thinking about for example um when if you're a young person uh trying to think about how to learn how to put a condom on you know where are the places where people where you watch sex you know and you look at, at pornography for example uh, you don't often see uh, necessarily positive representations of sex. Sometimes there are it, it can be very aggressive towards women or you might not even see the use of condoms at all uh, on, on porn. And I think this is an, an important uh, area to discuss because pornography, I guess, is something that's so much more accessible now given the fact that we're living in this online age uh, uh, with you know smartphones uh, and it's really hard to um create age verification on these platforms so is this something you ever have to navigate does the topic of porn ever come up as to how people are shaping their norms around sex and their understanding of it does that come up for you at all so we do a kind of pre-evaluation survey of the workshop so we kind of try to gauge teenagers understanding prior to coming to the workshop and then do a post-evaluation afterwards Mm. So from time to time, porn may be mentioned, you know, from a drop down menu in the pre-evaluation, but we don't tend to focus. It doesn't really come up during um, the, the workshops themselves. That's interesting. So perhaps they, they, they're either not uh, saying that they're watching porn or they're not watching porn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ronan, were you, do, you, do you have anything to add to that? Because I think, you know, it's a really important uh, issue with, you know, the prevalence of uh, pornographic material online. And we're talking about misinformation and that is actually playing a role in terms of uh, what is normalized for sexual activity. And there's, there's more sex positive porn sites. It's not here to say, you know, that all porn is bad. It has a role to play, but there are some aspects of it that are very problematic when it ter- comes to sexual health. Yeah, I think so. And I suppose it's about, again, it's, you know, I always come back to the idea that it's about information for for people and, you know, people who are 16, 17 years old now, they're going to be, you know, when they're adults growing up, like you're trying to instill something in them that they'll carry forward. And as you say, if they're getting their information from some places that may have uh, not necessarily the most positive impact on their relationship with, you know, sex and consent and things like that. And one of the um, things I always find at at the sessions, um, Dr. Caroline Kelleher that Zara mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes she'll ask students, you know, what does it mean to have consent? You know, what does consent mean? How do you know if you have it? And you can see people kind of actually thinking about that and working that out in their, in their heads of what it means. And it's, you know, trying to give them a more global, I suppose, understanding of sex and relationships and their own health. Um, that's, you know, not limited to what they may have encountered before, especially if they're getting their information or their understanding about these issues from things like porn. Um, and again, as you say, it's, it's, it's one of the things that is probably more prevalent, pre- prevalent now than in any other um, generation. But it's, uh, it's one of the things that we do um, see the, the engagement of students with it. So there does seem to be an appetite for getting, you know, these, this kind of information where it's evidence-based, it's, me- it's medical-based, it's delivered by experts rather than from other places, that, you know, that maybe is less, less reliable. We talked a lot about uh, misinformation and social media, for example, being a a key place where uh, some misinformation can spread. But is the programme Debunking the Myths actually on social media? Yeah, absolutely. We're available at debunkingthemyths underscore on Instagram, TikTok and Twitter. And we can also be found at www.debunkingthemyths.ie. Brilliant. Well, look, we're, we're almost out of time. Thank you so much for your expertise and for sharing your time with us today. And remember, Science Week is taking place all week from the 13th to the 20th of November. And for the first time 
and for the first time since 2019, events will be taking place in person. How great is that? So head over to scienceweek.ie for the full schedule. Until next time, I'm Anne-Marie Tomczak. Thank you so much for joining us.